right now in this moment, continuing in the perfection and the awareness of God. I am knowing there is only one life and that life is perfect. It is my life. It is everyone who is on this Zoom call, everyone who is not on this call, for there is only one breath, one present, and that presence is perfect. I speak thanks and declare that today we get to know each other. Today we get to continue remembering who we are through our topics, through talking, through laughter, through tears. We are rejoicing in this growth moment between all of us. And for that, I am truly thankful. I bless this knowing all is well, and I place it in the hands of the universe, knowing it is perfect, and so it is. How's everybody doing? Mindfulness. First thing that came to my mind when I heard mindfulness was the term stay woke. And then I had to really look at what mindfulness meant to me. You Google it, it says the quality or state of being conscious or aware of something. I have to be honest with you right now. What's going on in America has sent me through a series of emotions. I've been angry, I've been sad, I've been afraid, I've been many things through this experience. And I felt guilty about that. I felt guilty feeling like, well, I'm a practitioner. I'm a spiritual person. I know what the truth is. I felt guilty for having these feelings. And finally, my prayer partner last night, James Glenn, told me that we have to remember that, first of all, God always knows what God is doing. And secondly, I think I can speak for all of us in this chat right now that on some level, we all have asked for this moment. I have to remember that 2020, the, the year for vision is that we get to see the truth. My uncle, Reverend Mawata always says that there are two different sayings, you know, they're, 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 there's the song that says what you see is what you get, but the reality is what you get is what you see. Those are two different things. Are we seeing the illusion of separation? Are we seeing the illusion of racism, sexism, hate? Are we seeing the illusion of fear? Or what we doing is remembering that what we're really seeing is a growth in motion right now. This is actually a great moment. And I have to remember that and I'm asking all of you to help me remember that because I'm not always in that space, especially right now. I remember in high school, there was that movie, The Matrix. And I'm laughing at myself because when The Matrix came out, every New Thought minister had a Matrix quote and a Matrix, <laughs> uh, a Matrix analogy. But because we're talking about mindfulness, it's just so necessary to bring that movie up. I think we all have moments where we have our helmet on and we're plugged in to the matrix, the, the repetition, the, the familiarity of, of what we do daily. So often, we often forget that we are in control of every single thing in our experience. Everything starts in the mind first. Nothing can exist until it has been in the mind first. Anything we are experiencing, we put there ourselves. At times I love hearing that, and then there are other times where I really don't like being reminded that the very thing I'm complaining about is my own doing. One of my favorite books is The Power of Now. And I know that I'm one of those people who either stays too far in the future sometimes or way too far into the past. But we all know that we can only do anything right now. Right now is all that matters. 
So I'm okay with the feelings I'm having of being angry, of being a black man in America and not feeling appreciated. Of uh, uh, 39 years of seeing people clutch their purses and cross the street when they see me, or people too afraid to be in the elevator with me, or police looking at me like they want to shoot me dead in the street. I get to see all that and I get to know what the truth is. And it's not always easy. And I'm glad that right now my faith is being tested because that means that on the other side, my faith will be a lot stronger. I've joined in solidarity with those who were saying gay pride and love who you want to love and trans pride. I've joined in solidarity with the, with the Me Too movement and, and, and spoke up for, for women who, who felt like they've been, you know, wronged in that way by men. I've, I've done all of that. And much of me has been feeling like, well, wow, when are people going to do the same for me? And then my prayer partner had, had to tell me, he had to help make me realize, if you look at the protests, it's mostly people who aren't Black out there speaking for us. It is, it is people who are putting BLM stickers and, and solidarity signs on their cars and making sure they wave at me when they see. I'm seeing a lot more than that than what I have been seeing. So I get to remember, hey, do you want to see the stuff that you're mad at? Or do you get to see the very thing that you've been asking for this whole time? This is mindfulness. This is a very magic moment. And I had a beautiful discussion with Paul before we even came on and I had to tell him, I'm afraid that I'm gonna be way too angry, way too heavy, and I don't wanna bring that feeling. And we got to talk back and forth and I'm simply rejoicing right now, y'all, in the fact that we get to look at all of us of different walks of life, of different shades, of different nationality, and everyone is saying that an injustice to any one of us is an injustice to all of us. And I love that. I didn't want to do the traditional speak and open it up later on. I wanted, I wanted all of us to chime in and I want this to be all of us giving our input on this, on mindfulness, and what's going on in our country right now. Something I do really need to talk about is how the image of the black man has been portrayed since I've been alive. At 11 years old, I had my first experience with the police harassing me. And of all places, it was in Berkeley, California. And I remember being illegally searched when I was riding my bike through Telegraph by a black woman cop. As she was going through my pockets, I remember everyone just kind of standing there. And I remember how everyone was looking at me. At 11 years old, I was being looked at like, oh, well, he must have done something wrong. Let me just say to you right now, not once in that ex after that experience did I ever decide that all police officers were bad. Not once in that experience did I decide that all white people were bad. But yet, I have constantly had that experience to where when I feel like I'm in a place where I'm the only black man there, I have to be the, the non-threatening black guy. I have to take the bass out of my voice. I have to not move so aggressively. I have to do all these things to make you feel comfortable around me. And once that happens, I have watered myself down so much that now you don't even respect me anymore. And I have been angry about that for a long time. And now for the first time, I am seeing white people wave at me and show me, hey, I'm with you, bro. Don't worry, we got you. And I don't know how to take it. It's almost like I don't trust it. But the practice of mindfulness is to stay in the moment. Who cares what happened years ago in my life? What I've asked for is now happening. Am I going to focus on the past or am I going to appreciate this moment right here? I must say, watching the protest and watching how everyone is gathered to deal with this issue that has been an issue for too long 
for the first time in my life at 39, I am at, I, this is the first time I am saying I am actually proud to be an American. I've never felt that way before. I've never felt included. I've never felt like I was a part of any of this. And finally, it is happening. And it is overwhelming. If we really want to continue in this idea of all of us living in harmony and coexisting, what we have to realize is we have to be, be ready to speak for each of us. Paul showed me that there is such thing as a black privilege. And I didn't realize that until he told me his story of when he was in my neighborhood, the neighborhood I grew up in. And someone told him, no, you can't go anywhere out here by yourself. You need to have me with you. And then I thought about the places that I can go that other people are too afraid to go to. And I know I can walk through there and nothing will happen to me. I am royalty in those very areas that he may be too afraid to go to. I'm royalty. And I love Paul with all my heart. And I know that if he was with me, I would be the one who gets to speak up for him. All of us have a privilege in certain situations. And with that privilege comes responsibility. So before I open it up for all of us to speak, I just wanna talk about a time where I was riding the BART train and while I'm on the bar train, this brother, about 6'4", you can tell he had some mental health things going on, was being loud and kind of weird and making a lot of people uncomfortable. And finally, he decides to sit next to this white woman. And she's on the window side, so she can't really get up and leave if she wants to. And I'm nervous now because I'm knowing how this goes down. Something's gonna happen. They're gonna say a black man is harassing a white woman and me and this brother's head are gonna get beat in. That's what I'm worried about. So I'm looking at all the white men around me in their expensive suits, reading their Wall Street journals and nobody's doing anything. Finally, I see this man force a kiss on her cheek, a cheek that she did not want. And that's when I felt like I had to do something. I know that if my mother, my sister, my wife, my daughter came home with a story about how a man forced a kiss on them in the, on the BART train and none of the men on that train came to her head, how can I be mad at that situation if right now in this situation, I don't do anything? Sure, I was afraid. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I got up. I took it upon myself to get up. And all I did was look that brother in the eyes and say, hey, let me talk to my homegirl right quick. He got uncomfortable and got off at the next stop. And it was that easy. I sat down in the seat behind her. I didn't say a thing to this woman for the rest of the train ride. But I realized that in that situation, there was only one person who could fix it. And it was me. And I did it. I didn't sit back and say, oh, well, that's her business. I didn't sit back and say, oh, well, she's a white woman. And if she seen me in the street, she'd probably be afraid of me. So she's getting what she deserves. I didn't do any of that. I realized that I cannot be a hypocrite. We all want people to speak up for us when we're in situations where we feel we can't defend ourselves. We all want that. And if we want this world to be the world that we all keep talking about, that comes with work. That comes with somebody standing up and saying, no, that's not okay. That's the reason why the reply, all lives matter, is so offensive. It's dismissive. You don't really mean that because if all lives really matter to you, you'd be just as outraged as I am. It's a cop out. You don't really feel that way. What you really mean is I'm too comfortable to get involved. Let me just say another thing. And I know all of us know this, but I still feel like I need to say it. Black people aren't trying to take over anything. <laughs> We're not trying to take over nothing. All we want is to be treated equally. 
All we want is a fair shot. We're not trying to take over anything. Come on now. We just had a black president. If, if, if there was any moment where y'all should have been afraid, it should have been then. We are not trying to take over anything. We're actually trying to be a part of this beautiful idea called the United States of America. If you see me with my red, black, and green on and my fist in the air, it's not because I am anti-white. It's because I am black and I'm proud. And the very thing that makes this country amazing is that is it a melting pot for everything. I want you wearing your Kiss Me, I'm Irish shirt. I want you wearing your Italian stallion shirt. I want you doing that because it represents how great America is. But it seems like when we see black pride in this country, everyone gets uncomfortable. And I am ready for that to stop. And for the first time, I'm seeing that in this country. We're talking about making Juneteenth an actual holiday. We're talking about all kinds of things I never thought would happen. It's just too many reasons to rejoice right now. And I am so happy. I don't know if I'll feel different tomorrow, but right now in this moment, I am. I can keep going on and on. I'm ready for um, all of us to just weigh in on this, on mindfulness and how that pertains to to, to, to dealing with injustice and dealing with just the transformation of consciousness that's going on right now. So you ready to open it up, my friend? Indeed I am. Okay, folks, so here's the ground rules as we do when we do open up. If you're interested in contributing to the conversation, it has to be one at a time because of the transmission. So what we're asking, we have a Zoom team monitoring everybody. If you would like to contribute to the conversation, raise your hand. If you know how to do that in the participant mode, there's a way for you to be able to raise your hand or in the reactions, or you can turn on your camera and just wave. And Miss Peggy, our hostess, will be um, kind of corralling them, that attention so Lucian can respond so, and so that you can um, make your statement. Okay, everybody okay with that? Can we agree to that? Yeah. So who out there would like to share something with Lucian based on what he's speaking about? TC Curry has her hand up. Go ahead, TC. I would actually suggest that we save the space for black voices only oh. and allow the black people to speak. And so I cede my time. Uh, Luis? Unmute yourself, Luis. I'm unmuted. Okay. I agree and I feel, I feel a lot of what Lucian feels. At 75, I, I don't have the faith that things will change just because people are protesting. And when I say change, I'm talking about the sense of equality, the willingness of those in charge to allow each individual in this country and on this planet to have the same value. I've seen protests before. I've seen uprisings before. I've seen destruction before because of it and around it and during it. That bothers me, but at the same time, I can't condemn the people for doing this. 
there is an awful lot of anger out there and in here around the lack of e equal treatment and equal justice. I don't have the faith that the people in charge will move their feet and do what is needed from a lawful point of view to, to create equality. And I'm not sure that all the Caucasians are willing to abide with the new consciousness. There is an awful lot of backlash that is building because of this. Or shall I say a certain amount of backlash or percent of backlash or whatever you want to call it. There is backlash being created because of this. People are getting entrenched. because of fear of change, fear of lack of privilege. No, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I don't have to, I, I really don't have to fit. I have the willingness to treat everybody equal. I don't have the faith that everybody else is going to join me in that journey. Thank you. That's it for now. Ricardo has his hand up. Un unmute yourself, Ricardo. Hi, sorry. I've got a rambunctious four-year-old. Um, yeah, peace to everybody. Um, to be honest with you, I've been trying to, I, I just went back to work to, uh, this week for the first time in three months and I've been using kind of these eight hours during the day to kind of not think about everything that I have been thinking about, um, that's been going on. Um, and I think, uh, Jax, I think you hit a like a nerve with me and a point with me when you said that um, you're starting to try to accept the, the acceptance and the fight back coming from everybody that that aren't us that don't look like us you know because it's global now and um, I think I'm still I think like you said I think I'm still a little skeptical on how to accept that in the proper way. So I guess what I'm asking you is, have you have you found a way or have you been working on ways to be a little bit more? Because I, I feel like a couple weeks ago, um, it became so overwhelming to me that I, I went radio silent. Like I was flooded, my timeline was flooded from my, my, and you know, I have a lot of white friends from all of my white friends checking in on me and doing all these things that weren't really happening before it all went down. And even after, even, you know, with COVID-19, I, I wasn't getting those calls at, at uh, that rate. And so I was a little overwhelmed. And so I kind of went radio silent to the point where after a few days, I went back to call everybody and, you know, apologize for not returning text messages and calls. And so I'm just wondering if you've, if you've figured out ways and, and you know, have you done or, or figured out a way to kind of digest it all in a, in a more accepting way? Yes, I have. Can y'all hear me? Is my, is my mic on? Yes. Lucy, yeah. we hear you. Yes. What I'm about to say is probably going to be the most arrogant thing you've ever heard me say it will probably turn a lot of you off to me. Yeah. Let me say this ahead of time that 
I'm not really here to make friends. I'm here to tell the truth. What gets me through this situation that we are, and let's just be honest, black people, we, <laughs> we're, we're, we're on the very land that we were kidnapped to. The, the very land that was stolen from, from other people who were here all the time. So what I have to remember is that the, the vibe that something starts in, that vibe doesn't go anywhere until we actively do what we need to do to transform it. I think about black people and because I only have the experience of a black man, I can only talk about my experience as a black man. I think about what we survived, Rick. The, the, the torture, the, the emasculation, the, the humiliation, the, the terror they've put in, in, into our wife and children. I think about all that. You know, a lot of our white friends check on us, but they will never grasp the trauma that is in my family and your family till this day. They will never grasp that. I saw somebody on Facebook talk about how they remember when their grandfather said the police in Mississippi used to pull over families and lynch the dad in front of them. And these are the people that are supposed to protect us. What gets me through it, Rick? I remember that the black man is God, homie. That's what I remember. What I'm realizing right now is this ain't about how other people treat us. This is about how we treat us. I'm ready to see us treat us different. Maybe America will never accept us. Honestly, I was being a little gullible earlier, but probably not. I, it probably will never happen. I don't need America to accept us. I'm ready for black people to start loving black people again. And no, that's not a racist statement. Just like Ricky said, I got friends of all colors, all shades, all sexual orientations, that's not what I'm talking about. I love all of you equally, but I'm ready for black people to love black people again. That's what this is about. It hurts me that even right now in this situation, if I walk up to another brother and say, how you doing, homie? Peace, my brother, whatever. There's still some of them who won't say anything back. Homie, do you see what's going on right now? Are you out of your mind? You still don't feel like you, you, you have, I'm all you got and you're all I have, homie. You don't have a choice. In science of mind, we teach that we are God. We create everything that's going on around us. That black man, the black man is God's statement. That statement is my reality because I am a black man and I am the God of my reality. What good is faith if it doesn't get tested? Faith is a muscle. You have to put pressure on a muscle for it to grow. We are bench pressing this 400 years plus of oppression. And let's just be honest, everybody. Who knows God better than us? Who has actually had to use their faith to get through situations more than us? Who? Whenever somebody in the South gets sick, no matter how redneck they may be, whose church do they go to? They know where they get, where they get healed at. I want everybody to Google it right now if they can. It blew my mind when I saw how the Pope has everybody praying to, you know, that Brad Pitt version of Jesus, but behind closed doors at the Vatican, what does Mary look like? She looks like my mama, doesn't she? Because they understand to get real results, they got to pray to the real deal. This is as militant as you'll ever see me get. I've been the non-threatening black man on the pulpit plenty of times. I need to let y'all understand what's in my heart right now. I watch how the same look that I express the clothes I wear, how I wear those clothes. I step out into the world and people are afraid of me. But Justin Timberlake can go platinum looking like me and everybody loves him. That bothers me. This past Thanksgiving parade, Sarah had to get me quiet because I was ruining it for Olivia. 
because I saw the country singers looking like 1990s rap videos. It's okay for them to wear it now? Don't you get it? We are the ones who drop the artifacts behind for other people to pick up and treat like, like it's the greatest thing they ever saw. Gold went nothing until other people came to our country, to our continent and found it. It was like, oh my God, these shiny little rocks, we can make a fortune with these. We weren't even tripping. That's how abundant the place we come from is. We have lost focus of who we are. One thing I remember from my childhood is my mom teaching me about the Willie Lynch letter. Oh, and for yeah. all of y'all who don't know, the Willie Lynch letter was written by a slave owner who came up with the best idea to keep their slaves in check, to keep them from revolting. And he was pretty much saying, you gotta get the light-skinned blacks and the dark-skinned blacks to not get along. You right. gotta get the, the, the females and the males to not get along, the older slaves and the young. He was talking about com keep keeping confusion in the black community. Yep. That's what he was talking about. This is the perfect opportunity for our community to heal itself. This is it. Are we still making rap music about us clapping each other? Are we still doing that? A black man was just in office, homie. Y'all still want to kill over colors? Flex. I care about how others treat us. But right now, I care about how we treat us. Larry. The RZA said something that was very amazing when we opened up. Remember that show we opened up for the RZA? It was, it was the same year Oscar Grant was killed. And he said, listen, man, I'm from the same place as y'all are from. And all I'm going to say right now is you can't expect anybody to treat you any better than you treat yourselves. I was angry at him for saying that. How dare you say that right now? He was right. And I saw an example of it this year. When I got on the bar train, and it was another younger brother on that train, and me and that brother didn't even acknowledge each other. A few steps later, an OG got on, and he, he was dressed in his dashiki with the mansion pants. Brother was fly. And as soon as he got on that train, me and the brother stopped what we was doing, and we put our hands on our heart and acknowledged him. And he smiled and did the same thing that it set an energy on that train. They knew what was going on right there. That's all it takes. But here's the deeper thing. Are we going to allow someone else's BS to keep us from doing what we are naturally here to do anyway? And that is to love. Love is undefeated, homie. Love is undefeated. I have been in so many situations where I was ready to bang, where I was ready to tear up everything. And the person who I was mad at simply put love on the situation. It disarms me when people put love in the situation. On one hand, I'm just like you. I'm ready to, I'm ready to die in these streets with the protesters. I'm ready. If you're going to kill me anyway, let me do at least the things I can do to keep my sons and my daughter safe. But on the other hand, I would like to see them grow. I would like them to see me get old. So maybe there's a better solution to this. We're spiritual beings, but we did come here for a human experience. I see uh, Larry Williams' hand is up and then Ricardo is next. Can everybody hear me? Yes. <clears throat> First of all, I want to thank you for the message that you're sending and specifically for raising the phenomena of the Willie Lynch situation. Some of you heard me say this before, but I grew up in the Jim Crow South for my first 18 years. And uh, my mother and father, my father and mother were both teachers. My father was principal of the high school. So in many ways, I was seen as privileged, although I wasn't privileged because I was treated just like a black person, just like everybody else who lived in that community who knew I was black, even though I'm high yellow. But what I want to speak about is this message that you, you're 
spend, sending about us learning to love each other and respect each other, irrespective of how we look. I live in a world where I've always got to prove my authenticity, whether I'm in a white group or a black group. And you can't imagine how frustrating that is and how demoralizing that is to walk around knowing that most people who see me just from a distance think I'm probably white, but I'm black and I'm proud to be black. And my whole life has been spent being black and doing things to help black folks. And when I walk into certain communities where there's only black people, depending on the age distribution and the de demographic distribution, I've got to prove that I'm authentically black because some of the old black folks who grew up with the Willie Lynch syndrome think I'm not legit. And so I have to always go around proving myself. So I live in a, I, I live in a state of like no country that I'm uh, always having to prove myself. But as you said, Lucian, I am somewhat optimistic that hopefully with what's going on now with the demonstrations around the world and around the, in the country, that maybe there's a possibility that we're in a transformation state where people will begin to reach out and look at each other from a love point of view, because that's the way I live my life. As a person who loves irrespective of, of who people are, I see people as a part of the whole. But uh, I wanna thank you for speaking truth. And I hesitated to, to say anything, but this has been the torture of my life, continues to be the torture of my life. And I try and live with it as best I can, but I'm always authentic to myself. And I reach out and try and help everybody and black folks in particular with love. That's what I'll continue to do in order to survive. So thank you, Lucian. Ricardo is next. Peace. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Y'all help me. Um, and I agree with you um, and, and the gentleman before me um, about the whole love thing. And it's kind of where my question is, is because it's, it's to me, I feel like what I'm feeling right now, and it's not race driven right now, I'll say. Um, you know, social media can be very overwhelming and it's, it's obviously an active source of uh, information for a lot of people, especially of our generation and younger, and has been an active source of mine. Um, and a trend that I typically see, and that typically is, is that, you know, these big things um, that happen, these big historical things that happen, um, I feel like are marginalized by social media in a way that make them almost a trend and trivial. So I guess what I'm asking you is, and, and I completely agree with you, and I feel like instead of walking out and being a skeptic or being, you know, a conspiracy theorist, which I'm not, you know what I mean? But instead of having those feelings, you should go out and you should give out as much love um, and accept as much love as you possibly can. I think that just kind of, that's kind of how we should just be at all times, but especially right now. But I'm also wary of the fact of the love that I accept right now, because I might uh, perceive it as disingenuous and, and maybe it's real right now, but you know, 2020 has been, it's been crazy and it's a big year. We got elections coming up and I'm just wondering, you know, if the same energy is going to be kept three months, six months, nine months, a year, you know what I mean? If the same energy is going to be kept um, from all the people that are affected by this, that, that have been affected by this, you know what I mean? Like, because what I've seen is they just keep throwing in our faces that it's okay to kill black men. You know, and we, we, we protest and we have these movements. Um, we are only screaming and hollering at Black Lives Matter and BLM right now from another movement that was, that, you know what I mean? Like uh, from another movement from, I don't even remember, was it Philando or was it Eric Gardner? It, it, I can't remember, I can't even remember how Black Lives or which killing 
started Black Lives Matter because there's been so many. And I just feel like the, the most recent, uh, the most recent ones was like three, three people in, in, in three weeks or something within a month. And it just kind of feels like, you know, these things have sort of an impact for a little bit, but then stop having an impact. So, I mean, do, do I go about being skeptical of the love that's giving or do I accept all the love that's given? I guess is my question. What I would say to that, you hear me? All right, yeah. there we go. What I would say to that is, and I'm gonna just step out of the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the be spiritual answer. And honestly, man, I mean, I don't trust nothing about this country, you know I, mean? <laughs> I don't. I really don't. I, I, I trust what I've been seeing, you know? And even if it's not genuine, it's worldwide right now, and people are out there riding, whether it's genuine or not, and, you know, that's enough for me. I can give myself the love that I feel I'm not getting. I got family. I got you as a best friend. You see what I mean? So... Even if the rest of the world is being fake about it, and it's just like a new pair of Jordans right now. Oh, I got my new Black Lives Matter chain on. I mean, whatever. The, the truth of the matter is, is that we're talking about mindfulness and everything starts in the mind first. Let's talk about our ancestors. You know, the, the, let's talk about the people who actually saw the civil rights movement, like my brother Larry just spoke about. Let's talk about that. And one thing they all had in common was when they were out there on the front lines, getting hosed down, getting attacked by German shepherds, the one thing that I, that I recognized was that all of them were in pure joy while they were doing that for us. They accepted that maybe God put me here to do this and make it easier for the generation after me. And if that's my calling, then I'm going to do it with grace. So if God is calling me to be a soldier, and to get out there and to make it a lot easy so that my son doesn't have to have his heartbeat skip every time a cop is by him when he's driving, then so be it, homie. Then so be it. I, w I, I, I was afraid. Do you understand how many times dad would play Gil Scott Heron's um, 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 The Revolution Will Not Be Televised and I would hear it and be scared to death? I've been playing that once a day, fired up. I am in pure joy. Listen. What else can you do to me that hasn't been done yet? That's the beautiful thing about faith. You get to that point to where you're in a state of bliss and you're like, bring it. There's people who said that when they were sitting in the front row at the Autobahn, that they saw Malcolm sit there and pause when he saw everybody pull out their pistols and shoot him down. He knew it was coming and he stood there like a soldier and took it. That's what I'm talking about. Let's give ourselves that love. Let's give ourselves that power. I really, to, to be honest, man, it probably will be a trend that dies out later. It probably will. And let's just be honest. I mean, do we really have faith in our justice system? I always was angry, like, oh, man, how did, um, how did Zimmerman get away? And, oh, he, he, they let him get away. That man did not get away. That man can't leave the house. That man will be in prison for the rest of his life. He can't go anywhere. And no, I'm not one of those people who feel like there needs to be retaliation and everything, but what I'm talking about is the cosmic part of this. Black people have been talking about going back to Africa forever. Now you see all of West Africa opening their arms to us saying, come through, we've been waiting on you. Ghana is turning into the new Atlanta rapidly. And this is why it's beautiful. And I'm talking to everyone on this call. Here's why it is all of our responsibility. A bully doesn't stop bullying after its victim moves and goes to a new school. A bully just finds somebody else to bully. What happens when there's no more black people left to kill? You think the police are just going to be like, oh, well, all right, since there's no more black people, we'll act. no, whoever they decide is the next villain is going to be the next villain. And there'll be no more of us to help you after that. And you'll wish we were around to help you. There's people who talked about the Holocaust and said, first they came from my neighbors. After all my neighbors were gone, I realized that I was next and I didn't say anything when my neighbors were around so there was nobody to help me. 
This is all of our responsibility. As a man, how can I sit there and watch a woman being pressured by a man or a group of men and me not saying anything? How can I do that? I have, I have shed blood for my gay friends when they've been ridiculed and wrong. I have shed, ask about me, my knuckles have bled for my gay homies. I'm not one of these people only speaking on behalf of black people and everybody else can kiss my butt. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying, look, what I believe in is everybody should be treated respectfully. Everybody's life matters, of course, but I'm not saying it because I don't feel like getting off the couch. I'm saying all lives people matter because it's the truth. It's not the convenient thing to say when I say it. Are we really going to live the life of love? Or are we just going to sit back and cower? And I'm talking about all of America, not just black people. Black people don't got no choice but to fight. Even the sellouts can't really. I mean, you, you know, it's only a matter of time where they find y'all, bro. Like, at this point, we have to understand, like, we are fighters. And that's what we have to do. We've been fighting since we got here. I don't have the answer. All I know is what's getting me through is giving myself the love to keep fighting. Look at that beautiful daughter of yours. We can't let what's going on in the world distract us from the beautiful life we were sent here to live. We can't. And in a lot of ways, I feel like a lot of people are hoping that's what we do. It's not gonna happen. I remember a quote by Buddha, our life is shaped by our mind for we become what we think. I don't want us to become hateful because others have been hateful toward us. I'm not looking for that. I think a lot of what's going on with our community is we have taken on the values of our oppressors because we want what they have. A lot of people saw that movie Argo with Ben Affleck and they love that movie. I remember the night I saw that movie, I called my dad and I ranted and raving about it and he shut me down because of course he remembers the time when that happened. And he pops my balloon and says, did they show the part where they let the black hostages go? And I'm telling my dad, like, I don't even remember any black hostages in that movie. And he said that the movie wasn't all that good, son. So now I'm angry. All right, dad, elaborate. What are you talking about? And he said, well, in the real story, there were black hostages there. And they said, let the black hostages go. And when they were asked why, they said, because we relate to the struggle of African-Americans. And I said, yeah, dad, it's America. You know they weren't going to put that in the movie. And he said, of course not. People hear us, homie. People hear us. And in this philosophy, we believe that there is only one mind. People hear us, and they know. And what's beautiful is right now, we get to sit back and look and watch and see who ain't faking. I'm tired of fighting. I'm done. I'm tired of fighting. Let's see who's real right now. This is the moment. Put that privilege to use. That's what it's time for. Is this the America that we all been talking about? Because usually whenever I get mad, put my fist up, everybody reminds me, but dude, you're an American. Oh, how come whenever I'm ready to rip stuff up, now I'm an American? All right, fine. I'm going to sit back and see who's willing to fight for me then. That's what I'm going to do. Oh, and trust me, I'm looking at the clock. Because at the end of the day, if I am not making sure that my family feels safe walking up and down the street, then I'm not doing my job as a father and I'm not doing my job as a husband. And trust me, we both know where we're from, Rick. We can get down if we need to. I'm trying to be the peaceful one. 
I'm trying to think positively about it, but I have to be honest with my emotions. I am human. And there are moments where I am ready for somebody to say something stupid. I remember one time after church, I won't say which church and I won't say who this person was, but I was having an intelligent conversation after I was done speaking with a white woman who was a member of the congregation. Out of nowhere, a white man who always had funny energy with me decides to interrupt our conversation and say, yeah, at least his pants aren't hanging way down to the ground. <laughs> I handled it well, but I have to tell you that another thing I'm ready for people to understand is we've been not looking for y'all approval, okay? We've been let that go. We are not looking for y'all's approval. We, 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 we're not. We're aware of who we are. We don't need that. And here's the other thing that is bothering me about that. Why is it you can see how low my pants are, but when I say something is racist, all of a sudden you can't see that. The eyes are always on me to see how low my pants are. There are laws in other states that say you can find somebody if they're sagging too low but you can't see racism? Your son can have his hair be purple, can have all kind of piercings all through his face and end up being the, the CEO of a Fortune 500 club, a company. Me? I gotta wear an Armani suit just to be the janitor and I'm still not gonna be the manager. This is what I'm talking about, the life we face. I am angry, homie. Yes, I'm angry just like you. I'm angry. I'm confused. Am I considering going to Ghana? Heck, yes, I am. But I also know that this is the moment where we get to sit back and really ask ourselves, this thing I'm talking about, about faith, about love, about God, this is the perfect time to exercise to my full extent. I don't always know what's really going on. I'm not going to front here and lie. I'm not, no, I'm human just like you. Maybe, that, maybe it won't be until this is way later will I realize that. But this thing about mindfulness, I'm in the moment 100%, bro. 100%. There is one life, one mind, one heartbeat, one everything, one family. I speak in this oneness and declare that there is harmony and peace and love and understanding and compassion. I speak right now knowing that regardless of all the illusions, the only thing that is real, the only thing in existence is love. And so I speak from that place of love, knowing that with this love, we can get through anything, any experience. And right now in this moment, we get to dig deep and allow our hearts to open up and live from love. Right now in this moment, I am knowing that all listening and all outside this Zoom call, we are all gathered in love. And that this love spreads and spreads and spreads. And this is the very foundation in which we are all gathered. I am rejoicing in this moment. I give thanks for the opportunity to say what's on my heart. I give thanks for everyone else having the opportunity to say what's on theirs. I give thanks for those who came and provided the space to listen and allow us to say what's on our mind. Regardless of appearances, regardless of differences, regardless of any of that, we are one, we are a family, and I'm truly thankful. I release free of doubt, free of worry, free of concern. I release knowing that God has got it. I remove all question marks from my consciousness and I allow God's magic to do the trick. For this and so much more, I am thankful. 
And so it is. And so it is. And so it is. Thank you, Lucian.